work. So uh, before we begin our session today, I'd like to thank those who have been instrumental in assisting with this year's conference, if you will indulge me for a minute. This year's conference was the largest number of proposals, over 1,000, that LRA has ever had submitted for this conference. So throughout this past year, I was humbled and awed by the quality of the proposals and the quality of the literacy work that's being done by all of you. And I'm even more humbled, and now that nearly all of you have finished presenting, um, the work that we're all doing is incredible, and kudos to you, because the program is, is you. But to get to this place, um, I have to first of all thank uh, the 42 area chairs who helped review and send out and make decisions about all of these proposals. So if you're an area chair, would you please stand? I will now call. I will not call all of their names out, 42, but they are listed on page 132 of your program. That was an enormous task that we all undertook this past spring, and they patiently endured my persistent nagging and were essential in making this conference happen, and I'm grateful for their generous donations of time, expertise, and support. As well, I'm also indebted to all of you who generously volunteered your time and your expertise to serve as reviewers, chairs, discussants, roundtable monitors, and chicky hut monitors. Thank you all so, so much. I really appreciate your help. And I'm really indebted to the doctoral student ICG, uh, led by Jennifer Smith, Kate Brodeur, and Colleen Whittingham, that every time that I needed a gaggle of doctoral students to help with anything, they were actively sending things out on the, their listserv, and I al always got a nice group of doctoral students from around our great organization to help, so thank you very much. The faculty and graduate students at the University of South Florida were my local arrangements crew, uh, including Jim King, Danielle Dennis, Janet Richards, Jennifer Schneider. If you're here, please stand. They put together, along with their doctoral students, helped at every possible turn, and they put together that wonderful restaurant list. So thank you very much. My conference committee, consisting of my co-chair, Pat Enciso, Kelly Garris-York, Gwen McMillan, Julie Moore, Barbara Palmer, and Lynn Shanahan. If you're here, would you please stand? They provided amazing counsel and support throughout the entire year and gave me guidance uh, along the way and sustained me intellectually and um, emotionally. Thank you very much. I would also like to uh, acknowledge the tremendous support I have received from my amazing colleagues at the University of Kentucky. Go Wildcats, Susan Cantrell, if you're here, please stand, Lori Henry, Christine Malazzi, Kristen Perry, Mary Shake, Les Burns, and my dean, Mary John O'Hare. They have generously helped me at every possible turn and provided me with unwavering support uh, throughout the past year. And our current and former doctoral students, Pam Carell, Lindy Harmon, Luda Ivanyuk, Keith Lyons, and Amy Smith and Lindy Harmon, thank you so much for all your help. And finally, I am grateful to Arlette Willis for your guidance and your mentorship, and to the entire KWMG staff, including our executive director, Lynn Hupp, Barbara Beatty, who's probably running around. She um, put out every fire, both real and imagined, that I had throughout the past year and um, Julie Dross, Sasha Jacquith, and Alessandra, and the rest of the KWMG crew who are in Orlando. Um, thank you so much for, for the year. You will receive a link in a couple days to the conference evaluations, and Lynn will have that sent out via SurveyMonkey. Please make sure that you fill them out. They are essential in helping us plan future conferences. So um, please make sure that you help out Pat and CISO. Uh, for next year, and Becky Rogers for the following year. Immediately after the plenary today, we have the LRA annual business meeting right here. As immediately after we're finished, it will be short, but we need enough people to be able to approve the minutes so that we have to have an official meeting um, each year according to our bylaws. If you've never attended it, that's where you'll find out a little bit more about the slate of officers and board members running for next year and about our site selection for 2016. Um, and thank our outgoing board members. 
Finally, as in the past two nights, you're invited to join Vital Issues with the Field Council from 9 to midnight in Corals. And I extend our conversation about today's events. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Bradley from the University of Kansas, who is the chair of the Edward B. Fry Book Award. I have the distinct honor of presenting this year's Edward B. Fry Book Award. This award is given annually to a member or members of LRA who have written or co-authored a book within the last five years that advances our knowledge about literacy, displays inquiry into literacy, and shows responsible intellectual risk-taking. Before doing so, I'd like to thank the committee members who so diligently read the nominated books. If you are here, please stand. Jan Blake. Pat Isaac, Judd Laughter, Catherine Manderoso, Stephanie McAndrews, Sharon Peck, Monica Gordon Pershey, Ileana Reyes, and Leslie Rush. Thank you for your work. This year, as in past years, there were numerous outstanding books competing for the award. However, I'm pleased to announce the winner winners of this year's Edward B. Fry Book Award, Juliana Avila and Jessica Zacker Pandia for their book, Critical Digital Literacies as Social Praxis, Intersection, Intersections and Challenges. Their edited book examines the simultaneous implementation of critical and digital literacies and explores ramifications for the development and assessment of critical digital literacy curricula. Doctors Avila and Pandya ask us to consider how has the increasing ubiquity of digital literacies in and out of school affected our definitions of critical literacies? And how have the ever-changing perceptions of critical literacies affected how we define, teach, and engage in digital literacies? As one committee member wrote, this book offers readers vivid examples of how student engagement and digital literacy actually takes place, and it describes in detail the transformative power of critical digital literacies for both students and educators. And as another committee member wrote, no doubt future educators and scholars will look back at this book as instrumental in helping us to understand how students and educators accomplish the transition to digital literacies. Please join me. Please join me in congratulating Juliana Avila and Jessica Zacher Pandia, the 2014 Edward B. Fry Book Award winners. Can you hear me? I would first like to say how very much it means to me to be recognized by this particular community. You all are my literacy superheroes, and that makes this such an honor. I'd also like to mention how much a collaborative effort this book was. It was up to the contributing authors to put our ideas to the test, and we thank them wholeheartedly for doing that. This book was a response to the standardization and deprofessionalization of literacy education that has occurred. Given that, as well as the recent baffling moves on a national level to privilege testing and teacher education, we continue to need counter moves and counter narratives to challenge assumptions of what's worth knowing, who knows it, and how we measure knowing. My co-editor Jessica and I did not come into education in such an era of standardization. And as we now both work in teacher education, we continue to believe that teaching is an art and an act of hope and love and sometimes rebellion rather than a measurable science or collection of mandates coming from non-educators. This book is an expression of these beliefs and of collective creativity. Thank you for recognizing our work. Congratulations, Julia. 
I now would like to introduce Jim Bauman, one of our outgoing board members, who will introduce today's speaker. Good afternoon. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Professor George Lakoff, who is the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor of Cognitive Science and Linguistics at the University of California at Berkeley. He earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics and literature, interesting combination, from MIT in 1962 and was awarded a PhD in linguistics from Indiana University in 1966. Previously, he taught at Harvard University and the University of Michigan and has been at UC Berkeley since 1972. In graduate school, he came to question the conventional wisdom of transformational grammar. As per the famous example quote, for those of you who've looked at linguistics and studied it, you're probably familiar with the statement, Yastrzemski doubled to left, which led to establishing a theory of generative semantics, of which he was one of the seminal um, individuals behind. Then in the mid-1970s, Professor Lakoff began to focus on linguistics in relation to human cognition advancing an emerging field known as cognitive linguistics. Then in the mid, late, in the mid to late 18, 1980s, working with Mark Johnson, Professor Lakoff sought to understand how the brain could produce complex conceptual and linguistic systems, leading to his neural theory of language, which asked fundamental questions such as, how can the specific neural structures of the brain support thought and language? Quoting from his website, Neural theory of language assumes that thought and language are physical, structured, and given meaning by embodied experience and carried out by brain circuitry at the level of neuronal groups or nodes. This, respect, this perspective, he says, replaces the old cognitive science idea from the 1970s that the mind is software running on the brain as hardware, which any of you that uh, might share my vintage might sort of uh, have some resonance with that. Professor Lakoff's work on neural theory of language led to his current work on embodied cognition, which, quoting from a blog in the Scientific American, defined as the idea that the mind is not only connected to the body, but that the body influences the mind. Professor Lakoff's plenary this afternoon will address how embodied cognition can inform our work in literacy. Professor Lakoff is known for his hundreds of academic papers and scores of scholarly and more popular press books. If you've never read his book, Metaphors We Live By, co-authored with Mark Johnson, you need to, along with other scholarly titles such as Where Mathematics Comes From, Philosophy in the Flesh, and More Than Cool Reason. The titles alone will be enough to uh, capture your attention. Professor Lakoff has also engaged in a parallel, although cross-fertilized, line of scholarship on politics, which includes must-read books such as Moral Politics, the Little Blue Book, and recently revised and updated, although I see that it says the all new, um, Don't Think Like an Elephant. So without further ado, I ask you to welcome Professor George Lakoff. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for coming. Um, I've been going around meeting folks, and uh, it's a real joy to get to know uh, folks in this field doing very important work. Um, and uh, with respect to the book, it's completely re redone uh, and the basis of the, the last uh, 10 years. Now, uh, what? Hmm? I'm doing it on this mic. Right? No, I don't need it on the screen. I'm just. I have a laptop, but I'm not going to, yeah, I'm just going to talk. <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, uh, uh, all I'm doing with the laptop is uh, reading notes. Uh, and, okay. So what, uh, what I'd like to do is go through uh, some of the issues that have come up in my conversations with you guys. Uh, the uh, new title of this talk uh, really uh, ought to be 
uh, something like uh, the following. Uh, Neuroscience, embodied cognition, and the deprofessionalization of teachers, because it's very, they're all related. Uh, I want to start with uh, a, a couple of things about uh, consciousness and cognition. Uh, there is a field of, that studies uh, what is called post-diction as opposed to prediction. It's really the field of unconscious neural integration uh, before things get conscious. And let me try to give you a feel for how that works. Um, uh, the, um, the, the best person in this field is a guy at Caltech, uh, Shim Shimojo, uh, who has an over, uh, overview paper on this. Uh, and what Shim pointed out is the following. Um, he did an experiment of the following sort. Uh, you um, take uh, some gray screens, you show this to people, uh, and uh, when you're doing it, you use TMS, which is a way to knock out some neurons in the visual field to form a little hole. And you people see a hole in a gray screen. Then you have a second experiment where you do this again. Uh, and only uh, a few milliseconds after showing that and after it goes off, you um, then have a red field appears projected on there. And what people see is a green screen with a red hole. Consciously, unconsciously, the there's been an integration between the red behind it and the hole. And you don't see the red that was shown to you at all. You only see the red hole because your brain has integrated it. Another example. Uh, you know that uh, if you have flashing lights uh, you know, uh, fast enough, it'll look like they're just moving. So you, know, you have a light moving. So you can do the same thing on your arm. You can have little punctures that go really fast along here, and it'll feel like somebody's just touching you and moving. But if you do a couple of those, then you have one down below, and then it goes back up. You won't feel the one down below. It'll feel as if it was up here. Your brain has integrated it into that, and within 80 milliseconds, you're conscious only of something that wasn't there, and you're not conscious of something that was there because your brain has integrated it during the, within 100 milliseconds. Uh, another example, classic one, uh, they show a, like a little black button, and right underneath that, as they show it, they flash a light that then moves to the right. And what you see is not a light underneath the black button, but a light parallel to the black button on the right moving. Your brain has integrated it in a different way to form a different linear pattern. You don't see, what, what's happening is very, very different from what you're being shown. Um, and then the coolest one, and I'm going to explain this later in the talk, is uh, Shimojo uh, showed a, um, a sort of this gray pattern that goes back and forth, you know, and you hear sounds like um, pops and um, uh, little explosions, nothing happens, goes back and forth. But then he has a tone that rises and the picture goes up when you hear the rising tone. Then you have one that falls and the picture goes down with the falling tone. Is that cool? I'll explain why later. <laughs> he didn't know why. Uh, it turns out that our field had figured out that this should happen, but anyway, uh, it's interesting. Okay. With that as a, an introduction, I want to move on to something about, that you should know about children. The first thing to know about children is that by the age of, well, first of all, we were all born with um, uh, 500 billion neurons in our brain, each connected to 1,000 to 10,000 others. That's about a quadrillion connections. By the time you're around five, half of those connections have died off the ones that are least used. That's why early childhood education is so vital, absolutely vital, because that's when your brain gets shaped. Very, very crucial. Most people don't know this about early childhood education. It is vital. You know, uh, and people are taught to read early. They can learn to read very early. Now, uh, this goes along with um, uh, of another very important idea is when you have half a quadrillion neuro, uh, neural connections, that's a lot. 
and you need them. Why do you need them? Well, most of them are not being used most of the time. That is, neurons just fire at base rate. In order to do something, they have to fire above base rate, and they have to be parts of, uh, of circuitry. Now, and they become parts of circuitry by being linked to other neurons uh, in terms of uh, firing higher. So uh, how do you learn anything? Everything you learn has to do with the strengthening of synapses. You can't learn anything without some synapses being strengthened. Anything at all. And you have half a quadrillion in there to go. That's a lot. And you've got to be, and when you're doing that and you're learning things, you're learning them relative to other ones, other circuitry that has been fixed. And you wind up, if possible, using as much other circuitry that's been fixed before when you learn things. You learn relative to what you already know, period. You don't just learn just anything. And this is a major theme that is going to come up again and again in this lecture and that you need to know. You can only understand what your brain allows you to understand. People, and if you hear stuff that your brain is not going to allow you to understand, uh, it'll either go in one ear and out the other and be ignored, or it'll be threatening and you'll be attacked, or it'll sound ridiculous and be ridiculed. Uh, just look at our politics today. Uh, and I study it. <laughs> it's all like that. Now, uh, another important thing to learn is that uh, empathy is built in uh, to our brains. And it's built in via what are called uh, mirror neuron circuitry and canonical neuron circuitry. And, and, here ha and here's how it works. Um, and it was discovered in the following way. It turns out it was discovered with monkeys, with macaques. But it also works with people. It turns out that um, you know, uh, when a macaque or you uh, see this bottle, right? You know perfectly well that I can take a drink. And when you see me take a drink, you know what it would be like for you to take a drink. That's called mirror circuitry. That is, the same neurons that are firing when I pick this up are firing in your head when you would pick it up. Only it's unconscious. You don't know that. But that's what you know, why, you know uh, when you study how the brain is working. That's called mirror neuron uh, imagery. And it's there. Basically, it allows you to understand what someone else is doing or about to do in terms of their motor operations. Because the motor system is linked to the visual system uh, in that way to allow that. But now, what's particularly interesting about this is you can also tell if somebody is happy or sad or in, or in pain or writhing in pain or miserable and so on by looking at their bodies. How? Because via the mirror system, you know how your body works, but there's a physiology of emotion. The folks who study emotions, starting with Paul Ekman and on to lots of other people, have found that emotions are throughout the body. And what uh, uh, was discovered by the Damasios is that uh, everything in your body, of course, is connected to the somatosensory system up here and to the amygdala and insula. And so emotions are in the body as represented in the brain. So they're active in the brain because they're active in the body. Emotions are full body things. And you're going to see why that's important in a couple of minutes for language and thought. Now, the next thing to know is something about color. There is no color in the world. There is no green in grass, no blue in the sky. Uh, the the person with the red shirt has, does not have any red in the shirt. Okay, What is that about? turns out that um, in the world, objects have reflectances. They reflect wavelengths, individual wavelengths, combinations of those. But wavelengths are in colors. And they're different, different wavelengths all at once. So what's going on? What's going on is in your eye, if you have normal vision, uh, you have uh, three uh, color cones, which are sensitive to ranges of wavelengths, and they overlap somewhat. And then they have connections to your brain, and your brain takes the input from the color cones and creates color. Color ain't out there. It's in the relationship between the world and you. However, it's not all the same for everybody, particularly men and women. 
If you have anybody here ever have a uh, disagreement about color with someone of the opposite gender, let's see hands. <laughs> right? Anybody not? <laughs> it turns out you're both right for the following reason. Those color cones depend on X chromosomes. Women have two, men have one. And it turns out the way it works is there are 16 types of combinations of these for women. 16 types of color perception in women, two types in men, which are very close. <laughs> Not that any one woman has 16 abilities, but it's there. And that means if women talk to each other, they ought to have a larger vocabulary about color, right? Now, but in addition to that, there are some women who have four color cones, and they, and they overlap with the others, which means they can see a million more shades than everybody else. And I think my wife is one of those. She's an artist and a color specialist, but many of you may be. But the point is, color is made up, it's not out there, it is created by us interacting with the world, and it's beautiful. We beautify the world, and many birds have four to five color cones, and they see different kinds of beauty in the world. That is, it is us physical beings that create the beauty of color in the world, given the world and the way we interact with it, with our bodies. Is that cool? Now, what's particularly interesting in what I'm going to be talking about is a term from evolution called exaptation, invented by Stephen Jay Gould. And the, the idea is this is repurposed use of, uh, of things inherited before. So uh, dinosaur, certain dinosaurs who got cold developed uh, feathers. And then uh, later on, they applied these feathers to being able to fly, which is how birds got feathers. Now, uh, that's called exaptation. You have a previous thing of feathers for warmth, but then get used for flying. We repurpose the motor system and the visual system and other embodied systems for thought. And this is a very important thing. Uh, these are called primitive schemas that are there and take, come out of the body in various ways. So one, uh, one discovery uh, was done by uh, Srini Narayanan, who I've worked with now for over 20 years, who's one of the world's leading experts in neural computation. And what he did was, um, he, uh, back in 1992, he took a, uh, a virtual body online. It was, um, uh, uh, there was a University of Pennsylvania project on car crashes. They had a body with every, uh, you know, bone and muscle and so on that didn't move. But then the grant ran out and they let us have the, bo have the um, body. His name is Jack. And they gave us Jack, but Jack didn't move. And one of our grad students had to figure out how to get Jack to move because he had a do a computer project in which he, the Jack could learn uh, different um, verbs of hand motion in different languages. They're not all the same. And so you had to have the hands move. It had to be able to push things and lift them up and so on. And the foot, feet move and, and move around. And the question is how to do that. And luckily we had a first year graduate student from India who had studied um, you know, math, uh, computer science, uh, neurophysiology, robotics, uh, 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 economics, um, uh, seven languages, uh, you know, some Sanskrit, uh, ancient Greek, you know, the usual Indian graduate student. Uh, he comes in and he says, oh, uh, I know of a kind of computational system that's sort of like the way the neural system, neural system is, is such that when you move, there's a part of the brain in, up over here uh, which choreographs action, the pre premotor cortex, and then there's the motor cortex, which carries out the action. Motor cortex can't do much. It can do, oh, this, this, that, that, open one finger. But if I want to lift this up, I have to coordinate the actions, right? And that means there has to be circuitry here that then makes these fire in the right order and coordination. Now, so he, what he did was figure out, uh, he, he f took uh, this st a standard thing called petri nets went in there, redid it, reprogrammed it to be able to do neural computation and do this task. And uh, if you've ever studied um, motor control, which of course he had coming from you know India doing robotics, 
In uh, motor control, you have a hierarchy. There's a general thing. If I want to pick it up, I know I have to go get it. But then, uh, you know, if it happens, if the chair happens to be in the way, I have to go around the chair and move. I have to adapt to it. And what he pointed out is there's a hierarchy of structures and there's a general structure and then one uh, way to adapt to that and then a way to adapt to that and so on. And he worked that all out. And he, then he came and he gave a report to, our, to us and he said, you know, there's something funny about this program. If you look at it, the highest level is all the same in every action. It's all the same, even if you have different you know, versions of it layered further down in the hierarchy. And he's, I said, well, okay, he showed us, and here's what it is. He flashed it up there. I took one look at it, I said, I know that. That's called aspect in the world's languages. It is the way that uh, all actions and events are structured in the grammar of languages, in every language of the world. What that means is we structure actions and events using the motor system of our bodies, exaptation, the motor system we inherit through other animals. We use that to understand events and structures in the world in every language of the world. Pretty cool. And then I asked them, well, could you do the logic of aspect? Because as a logician, I knew that nobody had figured it out. He said, well, the computer program does it. Here's how it works for physical things. I said, well, could you do it for abstract things? That was his dissertation. He took an abstract domain, international economics, and showed that uh, there were metaphors that linked international economics to actual things. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, so uh, uh, sentences like, um, uh, France fell into a recession, Germany pulled it out, things like that. India is stumbling toward uh, liberalization of the economy. And then what he did was construct a neural theory of metaphor, which worked. And, it, and then he revised it since then to be able to show the following. And we'll get to what he showed. It's very cool. But I'll get, I wanna, before that, I want to go through a little bit more. So what he did was look, do what he called executing schemas or processing schemas. That's what these are, these motor control things. But then Len Talmy and Ron Lanneker, working independently, two terrific linguists back in the 70s, uh, w went and showed this from the study of space in various languages, spatial relations, that there are primitives. So it turns out just about every language has a different way of representing space linguistically. But when you look at it, it turns out that there are conceptual primitives that are universal. So, for example, this bottle is on the table. Well, not every language has an on like this, but it has three primitives. It's touching the table in contact, it's supported by the table, and it's vertically oriented. Three primitives coming together. And um, that's different in different languages. They don't, don't all do that. And what they did was they found out that there were, you know, 40 or 50 different primitives, things having to do with contexts and going rotations and things of that sort, all sorts of things, particularly things like motion, a source, path, and goal, and a mover, or containment, where there's an interior, a boundary, and an exterior, and entrances and contents in the container. And if you have something like into, what you're doing is binding them together. But these things have to be in the brain. You have to have what are called topographic maps in the brain, that is, uh, sets of neurons that are structured in such a way as to fit the visual field. And then those maps will give you things like motion. There's a map for motion called MT. Uh, and there's, uh, there are maps for containment and so on. And uh, they are built into us, and every language has them. In every language, you have motion containers. But if you want to do something in the brain like into, you have to know that if, you something, if he walks into the store, then he starts outside the store, winds up inside the store, and you're putting them together, except nothing moves in the brain. You have to have a circuit that links the end of, this, of, the, of the path to the interior of the store, and the beginning to the exterior. You have to have neural circuits that bind them together because they're in different parts of the brain. And those binding circuits are everywhere in the brain and they allow us to put things together. 
And what we've been doing over the years is figuring out what they are and how they work and so on. And you're going to see lots of examples of that momentarily. But that's a very crucial thing that you find uh, in, in all of this, this sort of this binding. Now, in the brain, you have thought. That is, you can't think without your brain. Thought is not out there in the floating in air. It just isn't. Now, what that means, again, going back to what we pointed out, is you can't understand anything that your brain doesn't allow you to understand. And different people have different brain structures and understand different things. And that means they're going to think about different things and understand the world in somewhat different ways. And that's an extremely important thing to know about. Now, one of the things you might think is abstract is morality, but it isn't. Morality concerns the issue of well-being. It's about other people's well-being and your well-being. That's the subject matter of that. How is well-being represented in the brain? Answer, we have neural circuitry called reward circuitry that puts out stuff like dopamine to make you feel good and norepinephrine to make you feel bad under certain circumstances. Uh, those are neurotransmitters and hormones. They're, of course, chemicals that are do both. And those things are physically in the brain. Well-being is there. Now, that's a very important thing to know for reasons you're going to see, because when we get to talking about how morality works and how you learn about it, it's through that. And we'll get there momentarily. Now, with all these connections, these primitive concepts, they are called schemas or frames, uh, there are more complicated frames. So a, a frame is just a structure that tells you what the structure of a type of situation is. So we're now at a conference, and uh, there's a speaker and an audience, and you're sitting in chairs, and I'm standing up here, and there are no elephants coming through, hopefully. Right? They're not part of this frame. Alligators out there, but not in here, right? not in this frame. And the point is that you know these. You know tens of thousands of frames for all the situations that you can understand. You know that. So for example, you know that if you're engaging in a commercial event, that there's a buyer and a seller and goods and money. And you start out, you want to get something. You have to have the money to get it. Uh, there are guys who have the goods. They want to get your money and give you the goods and so on. And you exchange. Fine. Uh, you know, if you want to eat, food has to be purchased, cooked, prepared, served to you, or served to yourself, and so on. Okay? If you go to a restaurant, you have both uh, a commercial event and food and a host-guest relation where the guest is the eater, is the customer. Neural binding across different parts of the brain. So if you understand the restaurant, you have to understand other frames that are bound together to give you bigger frames. Frames have a hierarchical structure, which is cool. And they have lots of neural bindings in the brain. Now, why does this matter? It turns out that we have a system of metaphors of tens of thousands of metaphors, conceptual metaphors, and hundreds that are learned before language. They're learned by children probably before the age of about three. And by the hundreds. And how are they learned? And what are they? They are cases where you have primitive concepts that map onto each other because they arise together. Uh, let me give you a very simple-minded example of this, but a very real one. These are called primary metaphors. Affection is warmth, a warm person, a cold person, and so on. Okay, Why? Well, it turns out that uh, temperature and affection are represented in different parts of the brain. But when you're held affectionately by parents as a child, you feel the bodily warmth as well as the affection together in different parts of the brain, over and over and over. When that happens, you get activation in two parts of the brain over and over and over. And when you have repeated activation, that part gets strengthened, the synapses get strengthened, but their connections, every neuron's connected to 10,000 others, along existing pathways, and they get strengthened, and they get strengthened, they come together, find the shortest pathway, and they form a circuit. That circuit is the metaphor. 
Now, why should the circuit go in one direction rather than the other? That is, why is it that affection is warmth, not warmth is affection? Okay? The reason has to do with a phenomenon in learning at the level of the neuron, which is called spike time dependent plasticity, SPTDP. Sorry about that. What it means is, let me just show you what it means, right? Here's a neuron and a, an axon, a neuron and an axon. If they come together like this, the one that regularly spikes first, that fires first, spiking is, you know, a bunch of firings all at once. The one that regularly spikes first gets strengthened in its direction, the other one get, gets weakened. And what you get is if you have a chain of them, you get them all strengthened in one direction from warmth to affection, not affection to warmth. Why? Because your body is always computing warmth, but not always computing affection. Okay? More is up. Why? Same thing. You pour water in the glass every time, right? Now the baby sitting there may not consciously know it, but its brain sees quantity increasing and, and verticality increasing all the time, every day, or many times a day. So what happens is two parts of the brain get active, but what it happens there is verticality is always firing, even when you're sleeping, that's how you can turn over, but quantity is not always firing, so it's going in that direction. Is that cool? Right? You learn hundreds of metaphors this way. And, and let me try to give you a, a feel for those hundreds of metaphors. Uh, the feel, it goes like this. Um, for example, uh, there's a metaphor that purposes are destinations. You know, that is, if you, know, if you want to um, you know, get a glass of milk at night, you got to go to the refrigerator. If a baby wants to feel comfy, he's got to go and find his blankie and crawl over there and get it. Uh, or if it my, was my granddaughter and she had to find her little baby giraffe called Fafa, who is giraffe, Fafa, and uh, she would go crawling over to get it to make her feel good, right? And um, this happens all the time for all of us. Purposes correlate with destinations and you have a metaphor for that. And then action, in order to act, you have to move, move your body most of the time, physical action. So actions are seen as motions. States are seen as bounded regions in space. You want to feel cool while it's not outside, you've got to go inside or under a tree. You know, states correspond to bounded regions in space or locations. And if purposes are destinations, what's a difficulty? It's something that impedes motion to the destination. It's what it gets in the way. Now, those are primary metaphors. They're learned in language after language around the world. They're universal metaphors based on universal basic concepts. And let me give you some more less obvious ones. A linear scale is understood in terms of a path. For example, uh, John is far more intelligent than Bill, far. John's intelligence goes way beyond Bill's, right? Linear scales are paths, and they can be horizontal or vertical, but they can be horizontal on paths. And the logic of linear scales is the logic of paths. Let me just give you, show you why. If you are, um, let's suppose you live like I do in the San Francisco Bay Area. If I want to go to New York, I, along Route 80, I got to go to Denver, to Chicago, to Pittsburgh, to New York. Fine. So if I've made it to Chicago, I know I've made it to Denver, but I haven't made it to Pittsburgh. Okay? Now, the same thing happens with money, all right? You can have no money in the bank. You can have, let's say, $1,000 in the bank. And so if you've got $500 that, in the bank, that means you've got 250, 200, but you haven't got 750. Same logic as moving along Route 80, right? And the logic is that the amount that you have on the linear scale is the distance from the origin to where you're going. So it's, it, that's what gets mapped. That is distance on, in motion gets mapped onto amount on a scale. Cool? Right? Very, very common, universal around the world. Okay? Now, that's how you understand linear scales. But then uh, you can uh, put, we'll, uh, put them together in a minute. 
Then there are other kinds of metaphors that are dependent on the body very directly. These, uh, for example, metaphors for anger. Now, uh, I did a long study of this with Zoltan Kurvachesh back in 1983. Uh, Zoltan uh, came to visit, and uh, he, uh, of course, is a world-class athlete, uh, was on the um, captain of the Hungarian National Championship water polo team. Zoltan is, or was, a little bit paunchier now, but he was um, 6'3", all muscle, about 230, right? Walks into my office, says, I want to study anger. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, he had uh, 400 examples, had read metaphors through the bifurcation. There should be some metaphors there somewhere. Well, uh, I happen to know Paul Ekman, who is the world's expert on the physiology of emotion. So I went to Paul, and Paul said, hey, we have studies on anger and all sorts of other emotions uh, in terms of what they do with the body. When you get angry, your, your skin temperature goes up half a degree. Your blood pressure goes up. Your heartbeat rate goes up. You have impeded visual acuity when you get really angry. And uh, you have harder time doing fine motor control. Hey? Those are the physiology of anger, right? Yeah. right? And your barrier teeth. Yeah. Now, uh, the, um, the interesting part of that is if you look at the metaphors for anger, you get boiling mad. It's hot, right? Uh, fine motor control is gone. You get hopping mad, right? Uh, you have um, uh, you know, pressure. You blow up. Internal pressure, you try to hold it back, hold it in, right? Uh, you get, uh, what about in, in impedance of vision? You're blind with rage. That is, the metaphors for anger are, depend on the physical, the body physiological physiology of anger. And what we found when, when Zoltan went off and then studied other basic metaphors, he now has dozen, a bunch, half a dozen books on this, they all work that way. The metaphors for emotions depend on the physiology of emotion. Is that cool? It's embodied as hell, <laughs> right? As embodied as you want it. Then, but what about the moral metaphors? You know, how does that work? Well, let's go back to well-being. And in your brain, you know, certain things give you well-being. So you eat pure food as a child. Or, or an adult, you feel good. You eat rotten food, you don't feel so good, right? Morality is purity, immorality is rottenness. That was a rotten thing to do. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark, right? From something you know from Hamlet. Now, uh, this is important. Then there are other things that make you feel good. Any one-year-old knows it's better to be able to stand upright than to have to uh, crawl on the ground, right? They work hard at it. I have watched, you know, I was a, a parent, saw my son do it, now I've seen my granddaughters do it, and they pull themselves up and they're very proud. They don't want to be crawling, right? You feel good when you're doing that. If you have to crawl, you don't feel as good. Therefore, morality is uprightness. Immorality is being a low-down snake, crawling on the ground, right? In those holes as George Bush liked to say. Now, <laughs> um, then you um, have other ones. Uh, the, there's a metaphor, it, you know, you're better off if you have all the things you need and then if you don't have the things you need. And that gets into the idea that well-being is wealth. And around the world, well-being is wealth fits with notions of accounting, wherever you have accounting metaphors. So if I do you a favor, increase your well-being, you say, I'm in your debt, I owe you one. It's metaphorically like giving you money. You know, how can I pay you back? Pay you back by returning the favor, moral accounting, you balance the books, okay? If I harm you, then there are various ways to balance the books. You, I can make up for it by doing re you know, uh, you know, restitution, or you can harm me back with retribution, or by moral arithmetic, you can take something good away from me, which is called revenge, 
right? Now, uh, or uh, you can forgive the debt. They say, oh, it's okay, right? So those are the mechanisms of moral accounting. And they're there, all over, constantly, every day. Uh, in addition to that, then there are uh, other kinds of moral metaphors. Uh, for example, uh, two of them have to do with the family. A child is better off if his parent, if they listen to their parents, assuming the parents want to take care of them. And so um, it turns out that morality is obedience to a legitimate authority. And the child is better off if the parents nurture them. So morality is nurturance, right? And then there are others. That is, a child that's very cute and good looking is better off than one that's really ugly and deformed. <laughs> so um, morality is beauty. That was a beautiful thing that you did. Or things are getting ugly around here. Uh, as the governor of Texas said uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve coming to Texas. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, then there are, others, and there are other metaphors that are important. Uh, for example, the conduit metaphor for, for communication, where the idea is that uh, in communication what you're doing is language is a container, you take ideas out of your head, you put them in the container, you send them to someone else who takes them out, right? Uh, it's not true, but it says you take the same ideas out as if, you know, uh, the person hearing it had nothing to do with this. It was just in there. And you have expressions like, uh, that came across to me very clearly, uh, or, um, you know, you, you try to pack too much content into uh, too, much, too few words, or the meaning is right there in the words. There are hundreds of these expressions in the conduit metaphor. And that depends on certain metaphors for thinking. So there are seven basic metaphors for thinking, but let me give you this four that come together. There's one, that, and the one that comes together is the mind is understood as a body functioning in space and ideas are the things it functions with respect to. So move thinking is moving, the ideas are locations. So you can be thinking in circles, you can reach a conclusion, you can go uh, wander off uh, on something else and so on. Uh, you can go step by step, okay? That's one metaphor for thinking. Uh, another one is uh, seeing is no, knowing is seeing, uh, where you show someone something by communicating, uh, or uh, uh, you say um, you pull the wool over somebody's eyes, or they have blinders on, etc. That's clear thought. That's uh, clear as mud, etc. So you have that. Then you have a metaphor for thinking, which is. Uh, uh, manipulating objects, you're tossing ideas around, that's where the communication is sending comes from. And then there's food. So you have um, half-baked ideas, warmed over theories, uh, things like that. And uh, then uh, you have, that's food for thought, you feed people ideas and, and so on. Uh, and uh, you have uh, theories of education based on these metaphors, going step by step for example, or spoon feeding ideas, right? Uh, as opposed to setting the table as a smorgasbord, right? And so on. You have different versions of metaphors based on these, metaphor, these, these ideas. Now, if you take these metaphors, they have to do with the field of experimental embodied cognition. So let me try to give you a feel for this. Um, there is a wonderful experiment, uh, a classic experiment in, in uh, cognitive psychology uh, is, uh, is the following a word of English? And you flash a word on, and then you say, you press a button, yes, if it's a word and, or a sentence, a sentence of English. You give someone a sentence of English. If it's a sentence of English, you press yes, or you press no, and they measure the time. And if they give you a, a you know, word salad, it takes longer, right? The random words longer, good sentence, short time. Now you change it. And what we're going to do is have a lever where you push forward for yes and pull back for no, or the reverse with other subjects. Pull back for yes, forward for no. And you give a sentence like, um, I, gave you, uh, um, you know, I gave him a cookie. Okay? 
And it's faster with giving him a cookie if you push forward for yes than if you pull back for yes, because you're giving him the cookie. Or I took a cookie, I got a cookie from him faster if you're pulling back for yes than if you're pushing forward for yes. You get the idea. But now if you say something like, um, I read him a story faster going forward through the conduit metaphor than pulling for yes. If you hear a story faster coming backwards toward you than going forward. The metaphor of the conduit metaphor is shaping your behavior and how your hand moves. Is that cool? Okay. Well, all right, it gets more interesting. Uh, remember the, me the um, metaphor of morality is purity. So there's, um, uh, you um, invite a group of people uh, who are subjects uh, at Yale into, um, uh, you know, into a room, and there's a bunch of other people in the room, and you say, oh, uh, go into that room and um, go, go up to people and whisper something nasty about somebody else in the room. Or say something nice, whisper something nice about something, somebody else in the room. You get people doing this with various subjects. Some people have to do nice things, some people have to do nasty things. Okay? Then on the way out, they have a choice. They say, oh, thank you for taking into this. We, we're going to give you a gift. Uh, you have a choice. You can either get um, a, a, a pen, a ballpoint pen, or a handy wipe. <laughs> Guess who takes the handy wipes? <laughs> right? The people who did nasty things. Or you can have, uh, you know, you have a choice. You can, um, you, if you want, you can wash your hands on the way out. Guess who washes their hands? Well, it's not everybody who did nasty things who washed their hands. So you know, it's, it's a certain probability, you know, so the certain number wash their hands and certain numbers don't who did the nasty things. But then they have another test, which is, did you feel guilty about doing this? The ones who wash their hands don't feel guilty. <laughs> is that cool? <laughs> the metaphor of morality as purity is guiding the behavior because it is physically in the brain. It is a physical active metaphor in the brain that is guiding what you do, right? All the time. That's how they work. My favorite one is this. These guys at Toronto, I know, I know these guys, <laughs> incredible guys. They figured out the following. They take a bunch of oils, you know, they have olive oil and a nut oil and a fish oil, okay? And what they show is that uh, under certain circumstances, uh, certain oils will make you suspicious, namely the fish oils. <laughs> Something smelling fishy. On the, and then they do it the reverse one, that is, if they have, if you a, a get suspicion uh, going on, on, in another way in the experiment, then you're easy, you can more easily detect the fish oil than the olive oil or the nut oil. <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is real, guys. <laughs> now, What's particularly interesting is the way that complex metaphors fit together because these, remember you have hundreds of these primary metaphors that are learned before language. But what's interesting, and they're universal, but they fit together in universal ways. And that's really cool because of neural things because they don't move in the brain, you can't move them together. What you have to have is circuits that bind them together that are active or not and you learn certain circuits binding certain metaphors together and in different ways. So let me give you an example. Uh, we saw you have um, linear scales or paths, and the linear scale can be horizontal or vertical. Let's start it with a horizontal one. Purposes are destinations that you're trying to reach. So uh, in there, uh, it turns out that uh, reaching, uh, if, you, if you're reaching a destination, if you have a purpose and you achieve it, that is getting to the top of the, to the end of the scale, to the end of that destination, which is the end point on the scale. And if you're just starting out to do something, and you know, action is motion, if you're starting out to do something, you're at the beginning point on this scale. Okay? And then the, um, uh, the amount that you've, of progress you've made, progress, the amount of progress is the distance along the scale. Right? And if something's standing in your way, you can't get all the way there. Okay? 
Now you take more is up and it becomes vertical. And you have a vertical scale. And if it has purposes or destinations, then success is getting to the top of the scale. That's why you climb the ladder of success. Right? And, um, and not only that, if you can't make it up, uh, then uh, you have failure is down, falling is failing. Right? So you try to climb the ladder of success, but you fell back. Okay? And then you have uh, things like the glass ceiling, which you might know about, right? which is part of the same metaphor system, adding a glass ceiling on, on, onto that ladder of success. Then uh, you have uh, sentences like, he tried to climb out of poverty and then fell back, using all of these metaphors at once. right? And they show up in language, but notice Climb has to do with going upwards, right? Success has to do with all of those together. That's why it's a ladder of success. You know? But climb out of poverty says that there is a container stopping you, some rigid container that is stopping you. And po being impoverished is being inside that container down below, and you can't get above it unless you work hard at it. Okay. And you can try to, you can climb out of poverty for a while and then fall back, right? That's how this metaphor system fits together. You have these standard ones that you've learned, and the, the interesting ones have to do with putting them together. And you may be putting like seven or eight of them together because you've, once you've learned them and you've learned the normal ways they fit together, it's just a matter of activating this. Now, how much time does it take? And the answer is less than 100 milliseconds. And that actually fits in, we've checked the times, it fits in the right amount of time. Because all you're doing, because you're branching out with lots of metaphors, each of the paths isn't that long. So it turns out that it fits this example. And this fits Christoph Koch's theory of consciousness, which says that consciousness is an experience within 100 milliseconds where it's all together, lots of bindings of things together, but it's a unified experience, but it has an internal structure and can be carried out in 100 milliseconds by putting together unconscious stuff. Cool? Okay? That's stuff, and you know, that's stuff like last week. He gave the talk on Berkeley last week, okay? The one on the 100 milliseconds was four weeks ago. Just to give you some idea of how fast this is moving. <laughs> Now, uh, what I want to do at this point is give you uh, another kind of thing. What does this have to do with politics and social issues? Answer everything. And that's why I have all those books on politics, like this one over here. And um, the important thing about that is the following. Uh, remember, in the metaphors for morality, there were two that involved the family. One is that you're better off if you listen to your parents than if you don't, and uh, you're better off if you're nurtured. So that gives rise to two views of the, of the parents. One is obedience to uh, a strict father, a strict father model where the strict father knows best, father knows best, and his job is to protect and support the family. He's got to be the strongest one, and he has authority. Everybody else is supposed to listen to him. And the way he teaches his children morality is by punishing them when they do something wrong. And the punishment must be painful, which is tough love, right? You discipline them physically, as certain uh, people in the NFL have been noticed to do recently. And, um, but that's all over the country. And um, so you have that view, and it's a kind of behaviorist view. That is the way that you teach morality to your children is by physically punishing them when they do bad and rewarding them when they do good. It's behavioral learning right, in, in the family. And then it turns out that that's the way you get to be moral. You have to have internal discipline to, do, to follow the rules. It's laid down by the strict father. You need the internal discipline. And if you have discipline, you can go out into the world and become prosperous. right? And what if you're not prosperous? then you're not disciplined, which means you can't be moral, so you deserve your poverty. You've heard this before, right? 
This is the basis of, this, of uh, conservative politics. And the way it works is that there's another metaphor. Remember how you learn metaphors, things come together? When were you first governed? In your family. So you get to learn a metaphor that a governing institution is a family. Well, what governing institutions are there? Classrooms, teams, um, you know, religions, uh, businesses, the market, and governments. And what that says is that the strict father family model can apply to all of them. Now, a nurturing family is really different. Nurturing families is you got two parents, if there are two of them, and they have equal responsibility. Their job is to empathize with the child, to know what the child needs, to make sure that the child gets a chance to be fulfilled in life, and that to, they, to be responsible, they have to take care of themselves so they can take care of the child. Okay? And that they raise the child to empathize with other people, to be fulfilled in life, but also to take care of themselves so they can take care of other people. That's what that model is. You apply that to institutions and you get, uh, in, in terms of governments, two different views of democracy depending on this. So here are the two views of democracy. They go like this. For a progressive view of democracy, you have citizens caring about each other. And they, through their government, they act to provide public resources available to everybody. And those public resources allow you to be free in all kinds of ways. So, example, take businesses. In order to have a business, you have to have certain public resources, like sewers, roads, bridges. Uh, the internet helps these days, devised by the government. Uh, satellite communication certainly helps, done through NASA. Um, electric grid helps, right? Uh, it's hard to run a business, you know, air, airports help. Training of pilots through the Air Force is a good thing for running businesses. Uh, you know, getting public resources, uh, you know, is a good thing for businesses. So all of those things are necessary. In short, private enterprise depends on public resources. The private depends on the public. And that's also true for private life, you know. That is, you need public health. You need to be healthy if you're going to have a decent life. You need to um, uh, be educated if you're going to know how to be fulfilled. You need to know the possibilities of them and get the skills to do that. Uh, you're going to need to have food safety. You're going to need to have a zillion other things which you all know about, housing available and things of that sort. So uh, in short, the private depends on the public. That is coming out of a progressive worldview. And it's true. Now, there's another view of democracy, a conservative view, that says that democracy gives you liberty, the liberty to do what you want. Every man his own strict father, right? You're king in your own castle. What that says is you don't want the government telling you what to do or anybody else telling you what to do. You want to be free to do that. That's liberty. But also, um, you, are not re you, you have individual responsibility. So you're not dependent on anybody else. If you did it, you did it yourself. You built it, right? You built that business with no help. And in addition to that, it's not your responsibility to help anybody else because it's all individual responsibility. They have to have individual responsibility. You've heard that too, okay? Now, one of the interesting things about these worldviews is that they're not absolute in people. It turns out there are things people call moderates, and there is no worldview of the moderate. A moderate is, moderate conservative is someone who has some progressive views. To do that, he has to have both worldviews, but apply them to different things, most uh, taking progressive worldviews and applying to progressive versions of issues, but some uh, conservative versions, but some progressive ones. A moderate progressive has some conservative views, and they have both worldviews and apply them in different ways. But there is no ideology of the moderate. There's no center. It does not exist. There is no single center that you can move to. Not there. That's important to know. But it's not just that uh, you know, these two worldviews just happen. It doesn't matter. You have one moral worldview, you have another, so what? 
One of them has a truth. The private depends on the public. The other one does not have that truth. And the other one can't see and understand that truth if they only have a conservative worldview. So, uh, to a strict Tea Party conservative, it makes no sense. It can't be seen. It would be ridiculed or attacked. And you experience this all the time. In addition, the conservative worldview has in it a constraint. That is, the person who is moral, the strict father, father knows best, he knows, he's, he knows morality. He's got to teach it to everybody else, make sure his spouse follows his moral and follows what he says, uh, as Ray Rice has shown. And um, you have, um, you know, and moreover, it's required that the strict father punish. Punishment is required. That's tough love. It's shown love. You know, uh, uh, if you don't punish, you're weak. You're not giving your authority. You know, so if somebody's supposed to be on authority, the worst thing you can say about them is they're weak, like they say about Obama. Now, the next part of this is important. There's a moral hierarchy that's imposed that says that some people are more moral than others. How do you tell? You look at who in the, who in the world has had authority in the past in this well-ordered world ordered by God. Okay? And there's a hierarchy. God above man, man above nature, rich above poor, adults above children, um, Western culture above non-Western culture, our country above other countries, men above women, whites above non-whites, straights above gays, Christians above non-Christians. That is where the oppression comes from. It's built into the idea of authority fitting morality and looking and assuming that looking at history will tell you who deserves it. Because in the strict father family, the strict father is always right. That has to be the case. And that view has to be, has to be maintained. Now, it also applies to all institutions, including education, which you have been talking about. And one of the most important things, of course, is racism is coming out of this, sexism is coming out of this, homophobia is coming out of it, uh, jingoism is coming out of it, et cetera, which you see every day. And I see every day, and we all see every day, especially now. Now, one thing that's important in education is the following. First, there's a principle, it's not just education, in politics and social life in general, a principle called reflexivity. Let me explain what that means. Thinking is real. It's physical in your brain. You act on the basis of what you understand, namely on the basis of the neural structures in your brain. That determines your action. And when you act in a certain way, other people, understanding that action, will understand it. If to understand it, they will learn the same idea. Those ideas then become real and they structure the world. That's called reflexivity. If you can get other people to think the same way you do, that can change reality. Reflexivity. Okay? Now, very, very important. And the idea is to get the communication system working to structure those things. And that works through language, because language is what activates frames and metaphors. Okay? Now, um, one of the problems that you have in the Democratic Party has to do with an ed our educational system, and especially universities. Um, if you are a conservative and you want to go into politics, uh, what do you study when you go to college? If you're a conservative, you're going to take some business courses. And that means you're going to take some marketing courses. And what do marketing professors study? Cognitive science. Okay? So this is important. You're going to get a notion of that. When the progressives go to college, they're going to study political science, law, public politics. They're going to study uh, not the way people really think. They're going to study uh, enlightenment reason. Right? And that isn't how people really think. Now, what does this say when you then start applying all this to education? 
If you have a strict father view, you're going to say there are authorities, experts, who have, who have uh, you know, power over other authorities, teachers, who are like children, right? And they need to be learned by punishment, right? You're going to be tested and evaluated. And then the actual children are also going to be treated that way. And you have like a behavioral view of the child as a machine that's got to be, and you've got to punish them by, you know, either they fail the test or not, or they get, don't get promoted or whatever. So you have that view. Then you have the view of well-being, which has to do with money. And there you have schools are businesses and they're factories. Now, what are their products? The products are the children. You know, they're being turned out. And you want to have quality products. That is your profit. Uh, the test scores show how much profit you have and whether you're producing the profit. And then there's a real effect. Because if you're a conservative and you don't really believe that you need public resources, you want to get rid of public resources. You want to get rid of public education and privatize education. And that's why you, people want to get rid of the Department of Education and teachers unions, get rid of that. And why the attacks on teachers? Teachers are nurturers. They care. You care. Nurturance is the opposite of the strict father model. Nurturance in itself, taught to students, says that they're not going to learn to be good strict fathers. They're not going to learn the things that are important to, most important to conservatives. The highest value in the conservative worldview is getting the worldview, the whole world, to work like by conservatism. So you are a threat, and a major threat, because of nurturance. Now, that's important to know, and all this is important to know. The issue here, and, and notice the problem, if you believe in the enlightenment reason that there, is, there, are, there are no frames, that there are no metaphors, that it's all logic and it works by probability and it's all objective truth out there in the world, like color is really there, right? It's all objective truth out there in the world, and there's a right way to think and a wrong way to think, not lots of ways to think. If you believe that, then you're going to want to, do, to use big data. You're going to want to use statistics. You're going to want to use all the things that are destroying the educational system and deprofessionalizing everything you have. That's why understanding embodied cognition is so crucial why it's so crucial to know how the brain really works, what metaphors really are, what really is in the brain, and the fact that you can only understand things that your brain allows you to. And then you also have to know that the private depends on the public. And all those ways have to do with one idea, freedom. Why? In business, it's freedom to start a business, to run a business, or to work in a business. In private life, it's free to be healthy. You're not healthy, you ain't free. You have cancer, you don't have insurance, you ain't free. You know? You get hit by a car, you don't have insurance, you can't be treated, you're not free. Right? You're not educated, you don't know what there is in the world, you don't have any skills, you're not free. And women's issues, it's not about abortion. The issue there is not just about women, it's about the freedom to control your body, whoever you are. All of these issues, whether they're racist issues, whether they're homophobic issues, whatever they are, they're about freedom. And right now, the conservatives own the word freedom, and, and they have to be taken back. This is about freedom. Education is about freedom. What does it mean? Education is leading out, away from being you know, kept in and not, uh, not understanding the world. That's why you have it. That's what it's there. It is about freedom. You guys are what allow us to have a free country. Now, this is vital because nobody's saying it. Right? What I do in the book is just go through all of this stuff. 
and point out. You know, you go and you talk to people and they're not saying it. You talk to teachers and teachers unions, they're not saying it. They're not saying what all of this really is about. That is what has to be understood, what has to be argued and said in public over and over. And you have to understand what it is you're up against. Right? And not only that, you're in the right. And you're in the right empirically. You know, the, the idea that you can you know, learn things through big data and through just statistics isn't accurate because the world isn't that way. The math is not in the world. The math is applied to the world via frames. Anytime you have a big data study, you ask, what are the frames behind the study? What are the metaphors behind the study? Because they're always there. They're not just out there somehow in the world. Somebody makes up that study. Okay? We have to show it. That's why this professional organization is important, very important, and why I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. He says he'll take some questions if people have some. Sure, if you guys have questions, great. Yeah. Sure, ask away. Yes, yes, come on. By this way, say it again about disrupting patterns. Disrupting patterns. How do we create new, new circuitries or, or new neural networks, as you're describing, such that we d displace the metaphors? You, by positively using language to describe what you mean. I think. By positively talking about freedom, by positively saying all those things that I was just saying. I mean, what I do in the book is I just give you lists. <laughs> Here, you, here's what you do if you're you know, in a union. Here's what you do if you're a teacher, you know, et cetera. But the thing is that the, by positively stating it and creating a context in which that can be done and then having a communication system of lots of people saying the same things over and over, that's how you disrupt it. And it's not disruption, it's change. Change, change is frame change, it's neural change, and that happens through language change. Yes. Hi. Um, I heard you in Wisconsin Heights. Yay. Do you remember me? <laughs> All right. Yes. In Wisconsin. Yeah. I, okay. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was. It was really wonderful. And um, a lot of people were excited when you were And I'm going to be there. back. You're going to be, be back? I'll be back in the spring. In the yeah. spring? Yeah. Oh, that'll be great. That'll be great for sure. So just, uh, you know, a, a couple of things because you hit on so many, I think, so many aspects and so many facts and um, but uh, anyway so what would be the best way to go about uh, this change in the education system as an educator what would be the best way to go about this change well um what we did, what we've started in Wisconsin through the Forward Institute and Scott, Scott's work, um, Scott came to me and said, what do we do? And I said, you need to set up a communication system. And you need to get people in all areas, whether teachers or union people or environmentalists and so on, around the state, a lot of progressives in Wisconsin, organized and f framing it right. And you have to have trainings and then you have to have ways of getting speakers to speak and, uh, and so on, uh, getting a news service, getting all of that. Uh, Scott has organized it beautifully, but he hasn't funded it yet. And we're now putting, uh, getting some other people 
together to help to try to fund it and to try to run it and so on, and then to extend it to other states. Uh, but in terms of education, you can do exactly the same thing through your organization. That is, you can set up a communication system throughout the country, through your organization, where you have framings, you know what to say, you say the same things, you have a training system, you have trainers for trainers, you teach it in your classes, you teach it to your graduate students, um, and you say it whenever possible, at all occasions, and you make the occasions, you create occasions to say it, right? to say these things. That is important. And what's important about that is that the things you're saying about education will be echoed about other issues. It will be echoed in feminist organizations, it will be echoed in environmental organizations, etc. These things have to be said outright. They have to be understood. They're about thought, about changing brains. And changing brains on the basis of the reality that that's what democracy is about. This is about freedom. From the very beginning of this country, we had, what, public schools, public hospitals. We had uh, a patent office for businesses. Uh, we had um, you know, a national bank for businesses. We had courts, 90% for businesses. Uh, you know, we had uh, public health out there from the very beginning. And this has been expanded uh, over the years in all kinds of ways. And that's crucial. That is what has made this country amazing. And people have to know it. Questions, others? Anybody else? Aria, hi. hi. So are you s suggesting that if we change the labels and change the no. frames? No, no, no. Labels are not labels. Words are not labels. Words mean things, and they have multiple meanings. They have metaphorical meanings, metonymic meanings, etc. Words evoke frames. So you have to figure out the frames first. You have to know what it is you're saying. You have to know what the metaphors are first. Then the language will come. Words are not labels. But you're offering a list of I'm things. offering a list with an understanding. I'm not saying, here's the words to say. I'm saying, here are the ideas. It's not too bad. It's you know, 180 pages. Mm -hmm. you know? But they're about ideas. And once you have the ideas, you can find the words. I can give you some. I can list a few. But you can make your own. It's the ideas that are important. And the ideas are contextualized where? In your brain. In your brain, OK. <laughs> and in everybody else's. Other questions? Other questions? Yes. I'll be a, like Oprah or somebody. Yeah, great. Okay. So this strict father me metaphor is apparently very, very deeply embedded. I'm thinking even before language. It's, yes. It's unconscious and nonverbal. So when you have metaphors that are so deeply held, um, what is the way to help people? You know, the res reduce the resistance to them. They're ridic You know, they respond with ridicule and other kinds of defenses. Okay. This is a crucial question. That's why biconceptualism matters. It turns out that just about everybody is some version of the other system in, in their lives. Every, you know, most conservatives are progressive on something or other. For, let me give you examples. There is what's called in-group nurturance in conservatism. What is in-group nurturance? You're in a conservative Christian church, very conservative, you know, but they will build houses for people who are regular church members, church growers, nice families who just happen to be, have lost, lost their jobs uh, or, or, you know, or have lost their homes for some reason uh, and they're not to blame for it. They'll go and say, we'll build you a house. They won't go out in the street, find a homeless person and say, we'll build you a house. It's in-group nurturance. They'll, you know, they'll do things for people in the group. The army is like this. In group nurturance in the army. You go in the army base, you've got education, you've got housing, um, you know, you've got medical care, you've got cheap goods, right? 
uh, you know, within the, within the army, you have bands of brothers who take care of themselves. They don't leave wounded people behind, right? In group nurturance, as part of that, it's built into conservatism. And it's that that you have to pick up on. So for example, I get students who say, I'm going to uh, Christmas dinner, and it's going to be horrible. I'm going to see my uncle, right, who's the conservative, right? We always have fights. You know, what do I do? I say, don't fight with your uncle. Your uncle wants to love you. He wants you to respect him, et cetera. Don't fight with him. Ask him one question. What are you most proud of that helped other people? Just that one question, right? People come back and they say, I had no idea. My uncle did three good things in his life. <laughs> and I say, next time you see him, only talk about the good things. Only talk about those. Maybe you can squeeze a few other things in, but mostly talk about those. Because the more that he thinks about nurturance, the more it'll change. Uh, one of the most powerful ideas that I've gotten from watching your videotapes and reading your books is that to not, in making an argument, not evoke a, a frame you don't, you're fighting against. Right. And I find that the hardest thing to do because I want to take on standardized testing, I want to take on all of these issues that work, the deep professionalization of teachers, and uh, I don't know, have you got some good tips of how you do that? With Absolutely, so a great question, right? Look, um, the first thing to do is be positive. Positive frames. <laughs> already. Yeah, I know, it's hard. But you have to be, you know, think about what you want to be the case, what you believe is true. And think about the language to do that in. Now, there are what are called implicit negatives. I'm the honest person in this election. <laughs> right? You don't have to say he's a crook. <laughs> I'm the honest candidate here. You know, I'm the practical candidate. Right? And, and this is important. There are implicit negatives that you can do. And once you have an implicit negative, you can then give the, the positive argument with the implicit negative, saying why the implicit negative goes more, is immoral. Why the other guys, if you don't do this, it's immoral. Because it's a moral argument, and it's always a moral argument. And you make it a moral argument. It, you never make it a practical argument about just about, oh, well, we have to have the money, et cetera. This is a moral argument. Who, is, who has the responsibility for supporting local education? Answer, the political leaders. That is, you know, the governors, the mayors, you know, the people who raise the money, uh, who say, you know, who, for, for schools, uh, the people in the boards of education. They're the responsible people, not the teachers. They're the people who, who should be responsible for making things work, you know, letting the teachers teach. I mean, this is a very important thing. They try to pin it on you, right? Get the, you know, the person of the, who's the, has the least power. You know, it, it's just like in Iraq, you know. <laughs> You, you, you pin it on the, you know, you're going to torture people, pin it on, you know, the, the PFCs who are doing the torturing, not the, the Secretary of Defense. Right? It's the same, the same principle. Pin it on the people who you need to pin it on. Think about what the world should be like and make it that way. Thank okay, you, George, thanks. so much. We um, are enlightened and inspired by your words, and uh, hopefully we'll work together to uh, change the future. If you could stay for a minute just so we can approve our minutes, that would be great. <laughs> Um, George will be uh, available uh, for chatting. We're going to continue with the business meeting.